Hello and welcome to our Media News Network Group. I'm Hovik Monocharyan, and together with Aspet Pedrosan, we are continuing our discussions with representatives of the Armenian political spectrum in the aftermath of the November 9 ceasefire agreement. This episode was recorded on Tuesday, January 5, 2021. As the protesters in the streets of Yerevan continue demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan in the aftermath of the war in nagorno karabakh the ruling Maisef faction seems to be firmly on the side of the Prime Minister. In the last week or so here at Grung, we hosted representatives of various opposition parties and today we will host a representative from the ruling Maistep faction to talk about the ongoing political crisis in Armenia. Today, we're joined by Maria Karapetian, who is a member of the National Assembly with the MyStep Parliamentary Group and the Civic Contract Party. She's a member of the Standing Committee on the Protection of Human Rights and Public Affairs and the Armenian Delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and heads the Armenia-Italy Parliamentary Friendship Group. Maria holds degrees in Linguistics and International Communication and European Studies from the Yerevan State University, as well as a master's degree in Peace Studies from the University of Rome III. Hello and welcome everyone. Hello. Hi, thank you for hosting me. So as a member of my step parliamentary faction and as a member of Civic Contract Party, we wanted to get your insight on what's the difference between the two for our listeners who are not aware and how do decisions get made? Is it all driven through the parliamentary group? or the party itself? Well, uh, from the perspective of the National Assembly, um, the factions, or to use another word, the political groups, are uh, the, uh, the subjects of the political landscape. Uh, so not the parties themselves, but the political groups, or uh, another word would be uh, political factions. Right now in the National Assembly, we have three political groups or three factions, and the My Step uh, faction is one of them, uh, together with uh, the second largest, Prosperous uh, Armenia, and the third, uh, Bright Armenia. Prosperous Armenia and Bright Armenia use their party names for the names of their political groups in the parliament, whereas the MyStep uh, political group um, uses uh, this, uh, this, uh, exactly this wording, uh, but in reality it consists of uh, two parties. One is the uh, civil contract party, which is the nucleus of the MyStep political group. And the other one, um, the name of the party is in Armenian, Arakelutsun, that can be translated into English as Mission, uh, which is a smaller party. And then um, um, there are non-partisan members uh, in the MyStep uh, political group. About 25% of the members of the MyStep political group are non-partisan, and about 75% are party members, and uh, their overwhelming majority are uh, members of the civil contract party. And you're a member of both the party and the faction, correct? Yes, I'm one of the parliamentarians of the MyStep political group, who also happens to be a partisan, a member of the civil contract party. The, you know, the, the, the name My Step came from the times of the revolution because it was the name of the uh, initiative, um, the march from Gyumri to Yerevan, and then later on it became the name of the uh, al um, alliance that um, won in the Yerevan uh, city elections, and then later on it became the name of the uh, alliance uh, that won in the parliamentary elections in 2018. So that's that's how we uh, inherited um, uh, this name and started using it uh, in parallel with the civil contract party name. You also asked me about the decision-making process. I can elaborate on that as well. Or if you think we should move on to another question, we could do The signing of the November 9 agreement caught many people, including those within the government, by surprise. Was the National Assembly aware of the agreement before it was signed? And if not, what were the reactions within the ruling faction? We are aware that Pashinyan had a Q&A session after the agreement, but is there any information you can disclose about deliberations that happened in the parliament before the agreement was signed? The parliament as an institution convened several times during the, uh, the war. Uh, the first time was when we actually uh, discussed uh, the um, state of uh, the martial law 
that the executive branch, um, the government had uh, uh, put in place and the parliament has the right to uh, discuss it, to uh, disapprove of it if necessary, or uh, as an alternative, it just enters into force uh, automatically. Uh, and this was the first moment when uh, the, 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 the war was discussed. Throughout the 44 days of the war, the parliament convened several times to discuss legislation that had to do with um, uh, urgent uh, measures that needed to be taken uh, to facilitate the workings of the state during uh, the state of uh, martial law. Um, and the agenda of the parliament was narrowed down to only these type of uh, bills, these type of legislation. Um, because the parliamentarians, um, and in general, it, um, the parliamentarians themselves and the whole country in general, um, was put in a state of um, mobilizing all efforts uh, to help um, uh, the war effort, uh, let's say. Uh, that's why the all other agendas were moved a bit uh, to the background. Um, when we talk about how informed uh, the public was about um, what was going on on the front line, uh, we come across a bit of uh, also uh, political and media manipulation. I know that um, a lot of people honestly think that they were not um, informed enough of what was going on uh, on the front line in nagorno karabakh but at the same time I want to draw um, the attention of these people and others uh, to the fact, to, to a small instance. Um, you remember that um, during the uh, press conferences where reporting was being done at the end of every day to the public about what was happening on the front line, at a certain point in time, a map appeared. Prior to that, we wouldn't see the maps uh, showing the advancement of the um, Azerbaijani troops, um, also um, supported by uh, Turkish army officers and uh, foreign fighters. Yeah, I think that was more towards the end of the conflict. But my question was uh, more related to the activities inside the parliament. Were you or any team members aware that Pashinyan was going to sign the agreement on November 9th? Ah, I see. Well, I personally knew about, uh, in, in very general lines, about the document um, that, uh, that we are going towards uh, signing a document a day prior to uh, the signing of it. Uh, but at the same time, I want to again remind us that there were three times when um, a ceasefire was signed. And these also came as um, quote unquote surprises, right? We heard about them actually about the last one minutes before it was signed. Um, and um, it's obvious that transparency and uh, a, a, a war aren't very well compatible. You can't openly and transparently talk about what's going on both on the front line, but also about these uh, documents and the diplomatic efforts that uh, are meant to stop the war. So uh, I understand that people expect um, a very large degree of transparency and that's what democracies should be like. But at the same time, it's just that these two, uh, two modalities of life a democratic, transparent working of a government and a war are not very well compatible. Uh, related to different ceasefire agreements, at least my perspective is that the initial ceasefire agreements were not as all-encompassing as the November 9 version, which includes building of roads through Armenia and so forth. Okay, after November 9, various political groups, church leaders, as well as various non-political organizations called for Prime Minister Pashinyan to resign and an interim government to be formed. The majority faction in the National Assembly has been relatively silent and there hasn't been much reaction to the opposition calls. Now, usually in the event of when a government has a major failure, whether in failed policies or losing a war, they usually take responsibility and resign. At least that's the opposition argument. Although Pashinyan says he accepts responsibility, he will not resign. Could you provide your thoughts about the situation? Of course. Just a small remark on the, my use of the word ceasefire. When I used the ceasefire um, the documents, the reference to ceasefire documents, I meant the prior three that were signed and breached uh, by Azerbaijan before the signing of the 
uh, November 9 announcement. Now that's the correct word for um, for that or declaration, let's say. And you are absolutely right. It is a much um, it has a much larger framework than just stopping uh, fire, uh, but it obviously falls very short of a final settlement, a political settlement, or um, to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Now, coming to the Fair enough. post post war uh, situation, um, at the during your introduction, you also used the phrase that uh, the MyStep Alliance continues. Um, behaving um, like business as usual. I very much disagree with this formulation. I don't think anybody, any citizen of Armenia or any Armenian across the globe can continue acting, feeling uh, like it's business as usual. It's obvious that this war um, has been uh, a big disaster, um, that uh, it is a big trauma and it continues to be one, that it has uh, implications that uh, continue affecting us and will continue affecting us both long term and uh, short term. Uh, the most important aspect of all of this is that the war hasn't stopped for some families. Those families that are waiting for um, their um, family members to be found, uh, those that are waiting for uh, the um, uh, prisoners of war from Azerbaijan to return, or for the bodies uh, of uh, their family members to be uh, located. Obviously for them, this war is, hasn't stopped by the November 9 declaration, and it still continues. Um, thousands of people have stayed without shelter, without homes, are looking for a place um, uh, to, to find a, a, a new uh, home at, and uh, so on and so forth. The list of the uh, problems that we need to deal with is uh, enormous. So, um, and it's obvious that uh, we have to make a choice between um, taking up political responsibility uh, as um, the um, as the power as as the as the how should I formulate this? Okay, we have a choice to take up political responsibility as the governing power in the country during the time of the war and to take up responsibility for uh, facilitating uh, the processes that have that are still continuing as a result of the war. Um, and the way we have um, managed this situation is first to deal with the immediate uh, needs um, that needed to be attended to, such as the humanitarian and the security issues. And that's why uh, the Prime Minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, um, published a roadmap that basically addressed this very first immediate uh, or outlined how they should be addressed, this very first uh, humanitarian and security uh, needs. And now that um, it seems like um, we see some progress towards uh, these uh, meeting these needs, such as uh, settling down the uh, border issues or the new line of contact issues, uh, moving a bit forward with the exchange of the prisoners of war, seeing some progress also in the return of the uh, people who have been displaced. Now, now that these very immediate needs, and these are also responsibilities, have uh, are being taken care of, we can now attend to the political um, aspect of um, uh, taking up responsibility for what has has happened, and our way of. Uh, um, taking up this responsibility is uh, starting discussions about um, snap elections as a way of understanding who the Armenian public, the body of citizenry, sees as their governing power following the war. I guess my question, if I can rephrase it, is that a lot of people in Armenia want the prime minister to step down because they see that the failure is so big that no solution with him staying in power will be acceptable. I believe there are surveys that show a significant portion of the population believes this. 
Also, since you talked about the snap elections, uh, the non-parliamentary opposition groups, at least uh, the 17, as they are called, as well as the parliamentary groups, including Bright Armenia, are against this proposal because they advocate a period of one year or six months to prepare the country for elections. What is your opinion on this? And why does Pashinyan want to have the snap elections sooner? And do you think that the country is ready for elections at this point? Let's just begin with that. Let's just begin with that. Of course, the country is not ready for elections, and it's not like we're offering to hold snap elections in January or February 2021. The the timing of the snap elections is also up for discussion, and it is an, a manipulation on behalf of these uh, political powers that um, that uh, that we're offering to hold snap elections right now. Of course not. Uh, and. Uh, Following the November 9 declaration, we've said that we can't talk about political changes until um, the situation stabilizes a bit. Now that the situation is more stable than it used to be, but obviously not as stable as is needed for snap elections, we have started the conversation about snap elections. I want to be very clear about this, that the timing of the snap elections is up for discussion. Now, to your comment about uh, the proportion of people who support the governing power or who support the opposition, no survey, of course, surveys are useful, but no survey can show us uh, the true proportions and no survey is legal to actually uh, edit the governing bodies of a country. And the only survey that can do this is called elections be it SNAP or regular elections. All of the other um, quote-unquote solutions proposed by the opposition are only ways of seeing this crisis as an opportunity, just like the, um, our governing power um, has oftentimes talked about, for example, the COVID crisis or any other crisis. Now it's for them, the time to see this post-war situation as a crisis and as an opportunity for them to edit the um, constitutional bodies, the bodies of public governance in Armenia, according to their taste. They treat the Armenian public as though we are 19th century communities that cannot uh, organize their life in a democratic republic and a group of 200, 300 people will get together um, thinking of themselves as though they represent the public voice, that they are quote unquote allies, and they will decide the fate of the country. And all of this is covered up with the beautiful word of national agreement. The only way to build national agreement and national solidarity are elections. Anything else is a way of usurping power. Armenia is a parliamentary system and the prime minister is appointed by the parliament. Are you suggesting there needs to be elections every time for the prime minister to change? No, I'm not suggesting that. Of course, um, the, our constitution allows for a change of a prime minister, but the, um, the political majority in the parliament that does this, or the parliament in general, needs to offer some logical explanation to the public of why this is done. Right now, I can't hypothesize what could be possibly a very legitimate reason to change the prime minister in the middle of the of the term. But um, of course, situations are very different and there could be a way. But what I'm telling you is that right now, me as a parliamentarian, I cannot turn to the Armenian public and explain to them why I make the choice of changing Nikol Pashinyan by uh, Vazgen Manukyan or Edmond Marukyan. Who are they? Where their legitimacy comes from? Why can't it be Edmond Manukyan or Vazgen Marukyan How, or any other person who <laughs> self-declares themselves as the one that can consolidate the public? Can they consolidate the citizens that are still supporting the My Step Alliance, that are still supporting Nikol Pashinyan. Why are they so sure that they are the factors of stabilization and consolidation? Quite the opposite. I think that would be, that would raise a true wave of discontent in the public, that the last um, accomplishment of theirs, the democratic breakthrough of Armenia is being robbed from them. 
Maria, aren't you providing Sarah Sarkisian's arguments in 2018 against him resigning? After all, didn't Pashinyan at the time point out that the number of people in the streets were his source of power? Accepting your argument, don't you need the participation of Bright Armenia and Prosperous Armenia to dissolve the parliament and trigger snap parliamentary elections? Because, as a reminder to our listeners, both parties so far have rejected the proposal. Let me start with this uh, last technical part. Um, technically, the parliamentary majority, by not uh, choosing another prime minister after the resignation of the current prime minister, will dissolve the parliament. So technically, it's possible to do through the hands of the MySTEP uh, political group in the parliament. But we prefer to hold consultations with the other two um, political groups in the parliament to find a meeting point. Um, and the, the process is right now ongoing, and uh, we try to understand why is it that they don't want um, uh, snap elections. And again, I want to underline that we're not talking about snap elections in the next two months, and the timing of the snap elections can also be part of these uh, consultations or negotiations with the other two political groups. And the opposite, technically, the two other uh, political groups in the parliament cannot elect, cannot choose a new prime minister, should Prime Minister Pashinyan resign without the help of the parliamentary majority. This is right now the makeup of the Armenian parliament. Uh, but I don't want my um, uh, my words to be uh, to sound threatening. I actually want the political groups in the parliament to come to a consensus point. Edman Marukin has said that without his party's participation, this can't happen. And for instance, he could be proposed as a prime minister without dissolution of the parliament step. Do you agree with that assertion? I heard him saying that without their agreement, the parliament cannot be dissolved. I think it's an exaggeration. I am just opening the constitution of the Republic of Armenia to see how uh, the elections of the prime minister are being done. I suppose what he means is that he will himself propose as a candidate and he wants to talk about the future as though it's very realistic that parliamentarians from the MySTEP political group will join together with prosperous Armenia that has a completely different candidate and elect him as prime minister. Is it probably his way of making some self-fulfilling, hopefully self-fulfilling prophecy, but it more sounds like wishful think thinking because um, it's obvious that uh, how Nikol Pashinyan was elected as prime minister, was it due to the votes of prosperous Armenia and bright Armenia? Obviously not. Um, it, it, well, actually, he was the uh, the leader of our political list, and it was an automatic process. But had it been uh, through voting, it's obvious that the parliamentary majority makes this decision, and there shouldn't be much debate about this. But what I want to underline again, that we want the solution to be a consensus-based solution. Because if these political groups refuse, reject the only democratic way of figuring out what the new leadership of Armenia should look like according to the voices of the citizen, that means that they prefer the current situation more than to the uh, hypothetical outcome of the elections. So this is what I should say. Because right, you know that right now the Armenian parliament um, has more seats than it could have had. The standard, the, let's say the, the number of seats that we usually have or should have, the minimum, is 105. Right now the Armenian parliament has been inflated because of the number of votes that the MySTEP alliance has taken in the 2018 elections. And I guess it's a very pragmatic calculation of process Armenia and bright Armenia that they will never have again such po big political groups in the I, I, I'm assuming that this is one of the factors that judges their non-preference for snap elections because they see that if the my step alliance does not take so many votes their political groups will also shrink because some of the seats of their political groups have been bonuses to counterbalance the parliamentary majority thanks and did you want to address my previous comment before we continue Right, right, right. I hear a lot of parallels between the situation now and the 2018. Now, again, I want to stress that the war is a big disaster for, uh, for a society, for a country. And in many ways, because of exactly this, the situation is not comparable to 2018. But if we just take the uh, processes inside the parliament or the proposed roads of political change and compare them 
for a moment. Um, the, the parliament, the current parliament has no problem of legitimacy. I hope we all agree about this, that 2018 elections um, have not been contested either formally or, or informally by any actor. And the parliament uh, that uh, actually was forced to elect um, Nicole Pashinyan as prime minister in 2018 did not even enjoy a percentage of the legitimacy that the current parliament has. Uh, this is one difference between the two, the two parliaments. So me as a parliamentarian and a parliamentarian of the Republican uh, faction of the 2018 parliament are two completely very different, uh, uh, very different things in terms of legitimacy and in terms of their accountability to the public of what and what they owe uh, to the public and where their mandate comes from and how they want to move forward. A second difference is obviously the, um, the all uh, national uh, movement of 2018 which was a period of uh, awakening, a pre period of democratic breakthrough, as I said uh, earlier in this um, podcast. And currently, again, I don't want to sound uh, absolutely um, no intention of sounding mocking to the uh, number of people in the uh, protests in this uh, current um, situation. But um, following um, the end of the war, uh, the opposition in Armenia uh, or those that positioned themselves as the opposition had all of the time, enormous financial, media and other resources to mobilize the public discontent. And I don't want to say there is no public discontent. The public in Armenia is very depressed, very unmotivated, very sad very angry, but the uh, but the, it's also objective reality that these um, uh, these emotions have not been um, have not forced people out or to support these political actors in their uh, enterprise. This is a second difference between between the two, two situations. So um, I don't think that it is uh, politically uh, a parallel that the way uh, Ser Sarkisyan was ousted and Nikol Pashinyan was elected, right now the same situation can take place uh, in this process. And again, I want to stress that Armenia should enter democratic normality. Even snap elections are a bit of an extraordinary solution. And we don't want to relapse into cycles of snap elections either. That's why I'm saying that if the political groups don't agree to snap elections, that means they legitimize the current situation and they prefer the current situation. So we should move forward with ordinary cycle of democratic changeover. But I absolutely absolutely exclude the possibility of editing uh, public offices through the will of uh, dozens or even hundreds of um, men from the past coming to see this situation as an opportunity. Maria, since you mentioned the number hundreds a few times, let me just say that according to some news reports, there were tens of thousands of people in the streets after a war while a lot of people are grieving in, in winter conditions. I just wanted to present the opposition viewpoint on this issue. Oh no, by hundreds of people, I don't mean I don't mean the protesters, absolutely not. When I say hundreds of people, I mean the parliamentarians because they are asking us to uh, to edit, right? To edit the results of the elections and to come up with this uh, uh, transition period. And I'm talking about... Well, you said hundreds of men from the past. That's why I mentioned that. Right. And those are... The, I mean, I mean those that crave power, not those that are in the streets. And of course, there are um, th third party uh, estimates and uh, counting of the number of protesters. But again, I don't want to concentrate on numbers because I know that people um, have different sensations and different feelings about the current situation in Armenia. I don't want us to base our judgments on the numbers of protesters. But when I was referring to hundreds of people coming together and deciding the fate of uh, the Armenian public as though they are 19th century communities, I was referring to those that may want to make decisions on their behalf, those that crave power and those that want to force the parliament to uh, legitimize their cravings for power. That's what I meant. As part of the Prime Minister's proposals for the snap elections, he foresees the need to change the electoral code in Armenia ahead of time, and I believe the Parliament is going through such motions today. Uh, what is the government's proposal specifically, and what is the reaction from the opposition? 
Mm -hmm. Very good question. Uh, but I want to just stress one very important aspect in the discussion of the electoral code. Uh, this is not due to the post-war situation or the political changes that we want to move uh, towards. The electoral code was in the agenda to be changed and there has been a working group working on it for already one and a half years. Right, so we want this to get this um, very clear that the electoral code. It, it is just a coincidence that now uh, it, it is also ready to be put in parliament. And to make sure that this doesn't sound like it's a manipulation, I want to say that there were three um, laws that were meant to um, to 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 perfect or to be, to better the mechanisms of um, public governance. One was the law on local governance, and that was the most urgent, or at least was phrased as the most urgent. And it was adopted, um, I believe, in the summer. It was prepared first and adopted in the summer because local community elections were taking place. <laughs> as we were moving on through the parliamentary cycle. The second law that was deemed very important was the, uh, the law on parties. And we adopted this law just very recently. And it also took uh, more than a year's work to, uh, to have a very inclusive process of working on the party law. And then now it's time for the electoral uh, code to be changed. Uh, so it's not that the electoral code is being changed right now, following the month of November. It is actually the result of more than uh, one and a half years of work. And another okay. argument to show that this isn't a recent um, reform, that it has been the aspiration following the Velvet Revolution, is that uh, the electoral code, the current one that will be discussed, is very much based on the changes that had already crystallized in the uh, proposed changes that were uh, that were sabotaged by the Republican majority in uh, fall 2018. If you remember, we wanted to hold the 2018 elections already with new rules and better procedures and mechanisms. And um, uh, th 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 there was a, a draft law that was uh, sabotaged in October 2018. So the current one is very much... Um, very much builds on the same political commitments and um, uh, aspirations for a better uh, electoral code that we used to have already following the Velvet Resolution. Now coming to the to the content, uh, if you uh, if you will allow or if you allow, I will talk about the law on the uh, parties as well because it's also um, it, the two are very much interconnected and they are both meant. Sure to make the, the, the political landscape in Armenia healthier, more transparent and more democratic. Um, just a couple of changes from each will give you. So the, the law on parties, for example, suggests that the list that the parties uh, bring to the elections, so parties usually make lists of their the candidates, right, to the, to the parliament, the, at least the first 30 names should be uh, chosen through, let's call them primaries in, in the in English thinking. So the party members themselves will choose who are the first 30 people and the order in which they appear in the list, at least the first 30. Prior to this, this could have been the choice of the head of the party. So one person could sit and basically make the list and present it to the Central Electoral Commission. And uh, now that we've changed the law, it will be a more uh, democratic internal process of the parties themselves. So they have to convene their big um, meetings or councils where all party members come together and make these um, choice of the of, of at least the first 30 members, the primaries um, within their party. Um, all parties will need to make all their transactions through non-cash. This is another very, very important uh, change that will hopefully uh, make the financial uh, proceedings of the parties more um, transparent. And coming to the electoral code, there are many changes. Most of them are not 
uh, will not be politically contested because they only make the processes more better and more transparent, such as campaigning, uh, making it more transparent, the financial uh, proceedings there as well, um, or making it um, the, the public resources, such as the public TV, um, accessible, more accessible to all actors, the smaller acts well, on equal footing, uh, and this also uh, will be very much welcome uh, by everybody, I'm sure. Um, and several other, um, uh, so for example, the cleaning of the lists, you know, that in Armenia for many, many years, the number of uh, people who can potentially participate in the elections was very much contested. People didn't believe in that number because they knew that people have migrated, they, um, some have passed away, but these lists remain uh, intractable or unchanged. So now through the the, the changes proposed by the new uh, electoral code, only those names that have IDs, passports or identification cards attached to them that have uh, an ongoing, that, that their date hasn't expired, so they're still in force, only those names will stay in the list. This will most probably shrink our electoral list by 10% and give us a more realistic understanding of the participation in the elections. Now, the counter argument would be that what if um, a hypothetical person in one of the communities has an expired ID or passport and they go to the electoral booth and want to uh, um, participate in the elections? Obviously, their constitutional right to participate in the elections will not be undermined and they will be able to do this even if their ID has expired, uh, but these will be very rare cases. Obviously, most people um, that deal with, the, you know, that live in this society, deal with the state, with the banking system, with right. social security systems will have uh, renewed their uh, IDs and passports. Um, and there are a few um, aspects of the new electoral code codes that are political and that are up for discussion. Uh, one of the most important ones is the maintaining of the majoritarian and proportional systems, electoral systems, or more like their uh, hybrid version. Uh, you know, the Armenian electoral system is very convoluted, very complicated. So the choice could be to move to a more simplified party list and that's all so only parties and their lists no individuals being elected through in the constituencies is that the favorite position of my step this has been the favorite position of the civil contract party for many years of the my step alliance this has been what was put in that electoral code that was sabotaged in fall 2018 and it remains our uh, political preference uh, but again we need to also hear the other political groups in the parliament and um, beyond the parliament as well with uh, obviously lesser importance attached um, uh, but to, to make sure that all political actors think this is the right way uh, to go towards and we'll do everything to convince them that this is uh, this will make the armenian political um, uh, processes healthier and there are a few other um, more political aspects uh, to be changed uh, possibly to be changed uh, uh, in the electoral code it it deals with the uh, time given to uh, political groups to form coalitions and the number of uh, political groups that can participate in these coalitions post elections let's say if nobody has majority right so this is also up for discussion because right now there are the timing is very short i think it's about a week and the number of actors that can form this uh, coalition is very limited i think it's about 3 uh, and we maybe need to make this, um, again, uh, more um, flexible uh, to make sure that um, governments are formed by through these consultations. And is there any talk of reducing the minimum threshold required for entering parliament? And what is my step's position on that? Uh, right. This is another uh, issue that is uh, more uh, more political and up for discussion. Uh, previously, we um, we were aiming at, or still, it is the the the, the idea to reduce the thresholds uh, from seven and five to five and three, respectively, for uh, alliances and for uh, singular parties. 
I hope this made sense. Uh, and uh, an additional an additional thing would be um, to discuss th this whole idea of uh, alliances participating in elections. There is the, 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 the um, uh, argumentation that in general these pre-election alliances should be banned. So including, for example, the My Step Alliance, right? So all political powers should appear by the name of their parties. Uh, because oftentimes this has also been the experience uh, in Armenia that uh, this serves as an opportunity for rebranding. For example, a political party that has completely ruined their reputation might come up with the um, name of an alliance to basically um, uh, change and uh, rebrand uh, their appearance in the new elections. Another way not to limit parties still would be to uh, allow pre-election uh, alliances, but um, ha having the legislation a clause that will um, force these alliances to use the names of all of the party members uh, in the alliance to make sure that the public recognizes who they vote for, if this makes sense. And why I started talking about this, that uh, usually in different countries, the practice is that the more political parties in an alliance, the higher the threshold. This could also be one approach, so a differentiated approach for alliance. Okay, thanks. One of the chief promises of MyStep and civil contract was the eradication of corruption in Armenia. As far as we're aware, there are no significant verdicts on prominent corruption cases. What is the state of fight against systemic corruption, and how do you see what the government and parliament has delivered so far versus what was promised back in 2018? Um, this is again one of the uh, theses that is circulated very often, right? That the corruption cases haven't closed, that there are no verdicts, or the processes are, aren't going um, fast enough. And there is, uh, of course, um, a dimension of uh, objective evaluation in these um, theses that um, the um, Armenian um, court system or the judiciary um, is um, very, very, very uh, imperfect or in a very bad shape, to put it very honestly. And it takes time to put the judiciary uh, in shape because unlike the executive and uh, the legislative bodies of power, which are formed through political processes, the judiciary isn't. And the approach that we have adopted towards the judiciary is to make sure that while trying to undo the ontological um, <laughs> wrongs in this uh, branch of power, we do not create new ones. So we don't want a judiciary that is not, let's say, attached to the past regime, but is instead attached to us. And this takes a lot of time. Maria, I understand I'm that sure. you're talking about judicial reform, but specifically, can you name what about the judiciary is imperfect that has prevented you from getting any progress so far? And if I'm wrong about the lack of verdicts, please correct me. So again, the specific argument is, why haven't there been any verdicts so far in major corruption cases? Right, that's what I'm saying, that it takes, it takes time. Um, let me come to just specifically the um, structures that we um, have been creating and will be creating to manage uh, the, the, the corruption case, ca cases. So, you know, obviously the Armenian Criminal Code already had um, uh, articles on illegal um, illegal um, enrichment, probably is the correct word for this, but Armenia lacked um, the law that we adopted uh, that, uh, that um, basically um, creates a whole new system and the law is called on uh, civil feature of illegal assets. Basically, it means that if somebody has uh, somehow legalized the, uh, the property or other assets that they have acquired illegally, there can be a, civ uh, a civil case against the property. So it is not a um, criminal case against the person, but it is ac actually a civil case against the property. And it basically helps the state uh, put the burden of proving that it's legal 
on uh, the owner. And if the person fails to do so, that means that their property is basically um, um, subject for uh, confiscation. Now, I simplified the law a lot, and this probably might sound a bit scary to people, but uh, obviously there should be, um, um, there, there are a lot of uh, mechanisms that protect uh, people's property, such as, for example, you can't start a case if there is no signal that something is wrong. So not any person's property can be investigated out of blue. There needs to be something to actually signal the beginning of uh, such a procedure. So the, the law has been adopted and it will take time for so, this. Yeah, but, but I'm talking about... We're talking about specific cases and I'm saying that Armenia had imperfect systems and imperfect leg legislation and what we're, we need to work on is perfecting these systems and legislation. Yeah. Maria, I just want to clarify, what you're talking about right now is civil forfeiture of illegal assets, which I think involves seizing the assets if they're used in a crime and specifically my understanding maybe it's wrong is that it is used for trafficking terrorism and other specific narrow cases so so yes yeah, so let's talk about the ethics of using this law or this type of a law for corruption but also my previous question was related to prosecuting crimes including corruption that happened over the past 20 years and why there isn't apparently any major success on that front and obviously, any talk of changing the laws today cannot affect the past crimes. You're right that uh, this law, uh, among other uh, signals, uh, can include uh, signals coming from cases of terrorism or uh, trafficking or uh, the drug business, but not limited just to that. There can be other cases that are apart from these uh, spheres of illegal activity that can still send signals for a case on the civil forfeiture of illegal assets uh, to start. Um, and um, to, 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 I won't be commenting on uh, specific uh, corruption cases, obviously, but I want to also talk about two other uh, structures that are in the process of uh, being created in Armenia to make sure that our judiciary and our investigative bodies are actually ready to um, to investigate uh, the cases that will um, surface in the future, you're right, but also uh, there can be a mechanism of um, um, th those cases that have already been opened to be passed on to these uh, to these bodies. One is the anti-corruption committee, so it's an, a specialized investigative body uh, that will deal. Uh, with corruption cases um, so that will be created uh, hopefully in this uh, coming year. Uh, and the second one is an anti-corruption court that will have specialized judges of the first instance and the second instance um, that will um, uh, make judgments on, on these cases. So these will help uh, us have a better professionals dealing with these uh, with these uh, with these cases because I, I will just bring a very honest example of why um, objectively these cases have not uh, been um, brought to a closure um, apart from my comment that I said that this is the usual challenge seen in all countries that uh, um, that are going through uh, corruption reforms it is a media thesis trying to um, degrade the, uh, the, the intensity and the speed of the reform, saying that, oh, there are no cases. And then when there are cases, oh, there are no verdicts. And when there are verdicts, oh, the sum isn't big enough, and so on and so forth. But to go back to the examples that I want to stress, uh, a lot of these cases require a very high specialization of making inquiries to um, is financial institutions abroad. And these inquiries need to be made in such, on such a high level of professionalism that those banks and financial institutions will not have grounds to reject them just because they aren't uh, professional enough. And you know that these banks and financial institutions in the interests of their clients will look for any possible excuse, basically not to satisfy the request sent by the state. Currently, our, um, our investigative bodies do not have the capacity to make such inquiries. And it is exactly about um, 
breeding, excuse me the word, a generation of such investigative uh, professionals that can deal with uh, such high level, um, with, 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 uh, with the cases that uh, require such high level of expertise. So are you essentially saying that the prosecutorial capabilities uh, are not there yet? They are not there yet. Maria, I want to talk about the various crises facing Armenia right now. Armenia is currently facing a health crisis. On one hand, COVID-19 is still a worldwide and also a national problem, although statistically the situation has slightly improved. And on the other hand, there is a large number of refugees from Artsakh in Armenia. What is the government? What is the government's strategy in handling these issues? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, already um, a portion of the displaced uh, from Nagorno-Karabakh have returned. Uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, the government of Nagorno-Karabakh together with the government of Armenia are working very intensively to make sure that uh, people who are re ready to move back have uh, proper housing. Uh, and in general, the, the government of Armenia has adopted um, several um, social assistance programs uh, for um, the populations uh, for the communities affected by the war and most of them are geared uh, towards providing this uh, social assistant in their home communities if they are actually able to return to uh, to their home communities uh, or in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, you are absolutely right the covid uh, pandemic um, and the war have complicated the humanitarian uh, crisis in armenia uh, i actually want to cite um, some uh, some numbers that um, on the 27th of october so the day when the uh, war started uh, only you mean eight September? point September, correct. Thank you. Yes, twenty seventh of September, the day the war started. The number of tests that were coming out positive was uh, the percentage was eight point five, and there were only four thousand five hundred forty one patients that were receiving treatment uh, from COVID nineteen. So we were able to bring down the uh, wave of the pandemic to um, uh, to a very low level. Uh, on the 5th of November, um, just uh, a few days before the end of the uh, war, the percentage of the positive tests was daily, was about 45%. So you can see how uh, it uh, surged up. And the number of patients that were receiving treatment was 37,562. So from about 4,500, it jumped to about 40,000 uh, with just within the uh, 40 days right. or 44 days of the war. Uh, the pandemics, the situation with COVID is now uh, going towards again uh, some uh, improvement and the percentage of the tests that is coming out as positive is around 15, I believe. Uh, but the important thing here is that the medical systems in Armenia over the past year have learned how to unfold, that means to, to start um, treating people and then to shrink back to the normal um, uh, regime when there is no need. And is there any insight on when the population will get vaccinated? For instance, in Israel, I believe more than 10% of the population has already been vaccinated. I don't, I don't have information on, uh, on this. Uh, my general impression is that the Ministry of uh, Health um, keeps the um, touch with the international bodies that uh, deal with, um, with the, the, the uh, production of the vaccination or the certification of the uh, vaccination and then the let's call it fair distribution of the vaccination among the uh, uh, the nations but what you know what we have learned through our experience that uh, now with these new other varieties of the uh, of covid-19 also surfacing that the most um, the, if we had to choose one very important measure to be taken, it is actually the medical masks that help uh, control um, the spread of the pandemic and as the last question, in the event of snap elections, would you consider staying in politics and running again for a seat in the National Assembly? That's a very likely scenario. All right.
I want to thank you for your time, Maria, and thanks, uh, thanks to our listeners. Thank and you. Talk to you listening. next time. Thank you, Maria. Talk to you next time. That concludes this conversations on Groong episode. We hope it was helpful in your understanding of some of the issues involved. We look forward to your feedback, including your suggestions for conversation topics in the future. Contact us on our website at groong.org or on our Facebook page, ann-groong, or in our Facebook group, groong-armenian news network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, like our pages, and follow us on social media. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.